get started here. Uh, good evening. My name is David Norton. I'm the Vice President for Research here at the University of Florida, and I'm just taking this opportunity to welcome each of you to the Rehumanizing the University Lecture Series, sponsored by the UF Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. Uh, the Office of Research is one of the supporters of this uh, center, and we're very proud of that. Uh, with that, I want to turn this over to the Director of the Humanity Center, Rockman Chair, uh, Dr. Bonnie Evans. So good evening and welcome and, and thanks so much for turning out at what I know is sort of the very frantic period of our semester. Um, this is the seventh lecture of the Rehumanizing the University, New Perspectives on the Liberal Arts series. And um, those of you who have attended our earlier lectures in our series know that our speakers have uh, discussed various aspects of the past, present, and future place of the humanities in higher education. Tonight's presentation by Professor Gregory Crean of Tufts University is especially focused on the future and the ways in which the growth of vast uh, digitized collections and the development of increasingly sophisticated analytic tools um, has begun to transform both the depth and the potential scale of humanities research. Professor Crane's most recent work is oriented towards accessibility issues and the long-term significance of the new users that digital media may potentially bring into the humanities discourse. By redefining the relationship between acad the academy and society as a whole, and by opening up this discourse, he argues that scholars in the humanities will have the opportunity to change perceptions of the disciplines that have of late been characterized in a, in a less than flattering way by political leaders and by the media. By cultivating a broader audi audience, he argues that humanists can tap uh, the wealth of resources that are offered by our university undergraduate populations, can attract a wider audience of supporters and funders, and thus have more meaningful opportunities to advance the intellectual uh, life of society as a whole. Tonight's paper, like those that have come before it, thus contributes to the ultimate goal of our series, which is to provide a critical reading of universities' contributions to academic advances and public life so that we can make sense of the complex issues that are integral to the future evolution, and some might say the survival, of a liberal arts education. I want to take a moment now to acknowledge the sponsorship of all the entities and organizations that have made tonight's uh, event possible. And I'm going to, rather than reading them all, I'm going to put our sponsors up here. Um, I'd like to especially thank for tonight's lecture the UF Office of Research, the UF Department of Classics, as well as the Rothman Endowment at the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere that have all made possible Professor Crane's visit. I also want to thank, as always, uh, Sophia Aker, Cindy Link, Chris Benora for helping to prepare for this lecture and all the others that are part of the series. We've placed information on the tables over there. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, there's a sign-up sheet there. We have flyers uh, for our series, and we also have snacks if you'd um, like to grab something to eat or drink as well. Last but certainly not least, um, I'm very pleased this evening to be able to introduce Professor Gregory Crane. Um, Professor Crane earned his PhD in classical philology at Harvard University in 1985, and since that time he's published on a wide range of Greek authors, including articles on Greek drama and Hellenistic poetry and a book on the Odyssey, and much of his work is devoted to the Greek historian Thucydides, He's written a book called The Blinded Eye, Thucydides in the Written Word, which appeared in 1996. He also wrote a second book on Thucydides called The Ancient Simplicity, Thucydides and the Limits of Political uh, Realism, which was published in 1998. As I've already noted um, before, Professor Crane wears many hats um, and has also had a long-standing interest in the relationship between the humanities and rapidly developing digital technology. As a graduate student, he first developed a Unix-based uh, full retrieval system for the th Thesaurus Linguae Graecae, which was widely used in North America and Europe in the mid-1980s. He also helped establish a typesetting consortium to facilitate scholarly publishing. And since 1985, he's been engaged in planning and development of the Perseus Project, which he directs now as editor-in-chief. 
Many of you are no doubt familiar with the Perseus Digital Library, which includes not only digitized texts from the Greco-Roman world, but works in Arabic, materials related to early modern England, the American Civil War, the history and topography of London, and a variety of other subjects. From 1998 through 2006, Professor Crane directed a grant from the Digital Library Initiative to study general problems of digital libraries and the humanities. And in 2006, he produced a named entity, sorry, a named entity identification system, published a 55 million word collection, and authored several publications describing the system. Since the rise of the Google Books project in 2004, with generous support from the DLI-2 program, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and the Mellon Foundation, he studied the problems and opportunities that arise when whole libraries, rather than curated collections, become available online. So without further ado, I'll ask you to please join me in welcoming Professor Crane. His title tonight is To Advance the Common Understanding, Reinventing the Humanities in a Digital Age. And thank you all. I know that in the middle of the semester, a 730 lecture, especially during the first week, the first a real opening day of the baseball season, uh, is uh, not always the easiest thing to do. I, it's not hard for me, the Red Sox already lost uh, the first of, and not the last game of the season. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today, that I've changed the title slightly as one compulsively does, but it's much the same general theme. Uh, and you know, I think the real question I'm going to start with is how do you measure success? And how do you, how do you evaluate or think about where you are and where you want to go and what the relationship is between the two. And I think that those of you who are administrators or those of you of chairs or deans or whatever will often think in terms of something like this. And this is a ranking of um, classics PhD programs from 2010. Uh, and since the fact you can't read any of those names is sort of irrelevant because you never, you know, most of you don't know those programs anyway. But I just put this up as an example of the kind of thing that we are habituated to look at as you know, the end goal. Uh, we're trying to get as high on this list as possible. But I would like to, to raise the question, uh, a parenthetical question, which is not really a distraction, but does anyone know what an inertial frame of reference is? Uh, how many of you, we have some scientists here. So. Basically, an inertial frame of reference is, from in the lay perspective, you're sitting in a train or an airplane, and your the cup of coffee in front of you does not fall, you know, fall in your lap because you and the cup of coffee are moving at 500 miles an hour with the plane, even though you you together are not going anywhere. And to some extent, that's what this is. Uh, this is an inertial frame of reference. This is a set of people working together in a single space. Uh, here's another example of objects that function in an inertial frame of reference. These are deck chairs. Uh, and you could think about the way we evaluate ourselves as rearranging these chairs and getting a better seat and a higher order here. I think some of you are nodding your heads and know where I'm going with this deck chairs thing. Because of course, this is, your, this is the inertial frame of reference of which these uh, deck chairs are a part. And so if you spend the classic state, you know, the statement is you're rearranging deck chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Uh, and that's kind of a hyperbolic way of thinking about, you know, if your evaluation, if you're thinking about this, uh, where you stand in this, uh, but you're all in the same boat. Uh, you know, the boat, and the boat goes down, these don't matter much. Uh, because it, for obvious reasons. Now, what is the Titanic? What is the inertial reference uh, or inertial space that carries the humanities along? How do you measure that? And I would just suggest one slide uh, that I've used and updated recently. These are 2011 budgets. And again, you can't really read the little small print, but I'll just say starting at the bottom, that is the NIH budget. It's about $31 billion last year. Uh, the next bar on top, as you can also see, is the NSF budget. That's about $7 billion. And the bar and on top uh, is the NEH budget, uh, which it's very good. And thank you for having a high-definition projector. 
so that you can actually see that there is, in fact, a blue bar there. Uh, so you're going from $150 million to $30 billion, or a factor of an order of magnitude and a factor of two, 200 times. So you are, NEH is a rounding error, or is a, you know, is the, know, some trivial uh, uh, blip on the larger budget. And this is a, you, know, you can argue about this, and, but fundamentally, this is a social judgment. This is a statement of, uh, by the American people, you know, to use a grand term, as to the relative importance of biological existence on the bottom, uh, of, under, of STEM technology, science technology, engineering, and mathematical technologies to build stuff, to make money, uh, and then at the top you know, are the humanities. Uh, and that's really our inertial frame of reference. And one way of thinking about it, very crudely, but I'm a Thucydidean scholar, so I worked on realism and self-interest. Uh, so thinking very crudely, one way of, of saying what the real issue is, it's not this, where you stand here, it's this. It's moving that top bar up a little bit, which reflects a different social consensus about the contributions made from the humanities to society as a whole. And if that were to happen, you know, you would, that's such a small sum of money, you know, in the, in the great scheme of things, it would be invisible, any major change. Another way of thinking about where we stand is to look at, say, an analysis of um, the intellectual world. And this is from an article published in the Public Library of Science a couple of years ago. And it is an analysis of who actually, what, journals are connected to what. Uh, and this is not a, uh, an analysis of bibliographic references, because those, those of you who are undergraduates, please cover your ears, because I'll explain something which is really shocking, and you really shouldn't know yet, but that when you cite things in bibliographies, you don't cite things that are really important. You cite things because people are going to review you uh, and read your paper, and if they don't find their publications there, you are you're in big trouble. Uh, so you have to make sure you put in things that you value, but who's going to be reading you, you better put them in. So you can't really use the actual citations to see what matters. So what these guys did was they analyzed web logs to see where people actually went. And they followed what, what people actually, the real actions. And they looked at what connections were made between different journals uh, and clusters of journals. And this is sort of an overall map. And here you see a detail. Uh, and you see in this detail, classical studies is a clump on the top, and neurology is a little clump on the bottom. If you go back here, you can see the classical studies. Uh, do I have a classical studies is, well, it's up there. It's the gray blob attached to the great continent of social and humanity, social sciences and humanities who all are connected, and the, human, the classes are out here on an island. And so one way, as the classes are thinking about how to improve your existence, is to have, be less isolated and to connect more fully with the broader discourse of the humanities and social sciences and not be an outlier, because that basically means that we collectively in the, in the classics are, a, are the Roche Motel of journals, in that the ideas check in and they don't check out. The idea is don't they come in and they don't travel back. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a problem uh, given our responsibility to make, have classical antiquity play the widest possible role in general academic literature, the discourse. But I point out that, you know, that if any of you are neurologists and you see your journals are sitting there floating in isolation, I'm not sure you're going to have the same kind of angst uh, as I have uh, because, you know, obviously, the, let me ask the other question. So this is a two-dimensional representation. Uh, and my question is, where is the third dimension? Uh, that flat dimension, like a galaxy, that's the relationship of academic disciplines to each other. But what's the depth behind it? And really, of course, that's why, if you're doing neurology, you're, you may not be particularly worried uh, that nobody else but neurologists reads your journals. Because grandma is going to be, or you, or you uh, have the probability of having some kind of therapeutic benefit from the research done in neurology. And so the consequences of the research done in those specialized journals has a real lived impact on your biological well-being. And the question is, what's the third dimension for anyone 
in the humanities and social sciences. Why should anyone care what we do in the, in the academy? And the fact that was those slides of relative funding are, are quite a blunt statement of that people don't care, of how much they care. And that's kind of a, a social judgment. So that's really what the question is, what is the third dimension for humanists? And this is kind of the, the big theme that I think about, even if I zero in now on a more narrow theme, uh, which will be thinking about the past. Uh, but thinking about really, I'm going to talk about how you deal with really crazy, hard, old languages. And these are interesting because they're a boundary condition. Because if you can disseminate knowledge of things in languages like Greek or classical or Armenian or whatever, then you can also disseminate knowledge from 19th century diaries from Florida, uh, or from languages that have living speakers. Uh, so this is in some ways, a it's a hard problem. Uh, and if you can solve this, then other problems can be solved as well. So of course, we have to like unite. Uh, and if I were to, if I, if, if some ridiculous billionaire asked me to set up a classics department and we're gonna endow a bunch of chairs and to design it, uh, he'd be in for a lot of money uh, because I would not just think of Greek and Latin. Uh, and I think that in a global society, we need to think in terms of many different cultural systems that interact and contribute with each other, contribute to each other over long periods of time. And the Eurasian landmass is a pretty isolated unit uh, you're, with North Africa and Africa thrown in there. Uh, you know, all that whole clump interacts for, for, for thousands of years. Uh, and when we look at Greek and Latin, we must bear in mind that there's an influence, there are ideas circulating from the Pacific to the Atlantic, maybe not as quickly as they, as they circulate from Greece to Rome over thousands of years. A friend of mine who teaches uh, Greek and Arabic, which, which I'll touch upon later, uh, likes to say that the West means everything west of the Hindu Kush. Because everything west of the Hindu Kush interacts intensely. Uh, and even if sometimes the interaction is like chasing each other around and doing unkind things to each other, that is a kind of intimate relationship as well, and one that is long-standing and profound. Uh, and how what we need to do is to train people to think in detail about some subset of, of these, these languages uh, and to realize the broader context. And so by my little selective count, you've got about, you have to think about speakers in at least eight languages, modern languages. And I would pick the six UN languages, and because of classical Eurocentric tradition, I would put in, I would add German and Italian. That gives us eight. If you're in China, you might add Vietnamese and Cambodian. I don't know. There are different, there will be different clusters in different parts of the world. But the point is, I can't learn eight languages. You know, I don't know about you. I'm too old. Uh, but it's, that's your audience minimally. Uh, and the top and then the bottom, if you're just dealing with, you know, say, Europe, Asia, North Africa, you've got at least 20 odd languages you've got to think about. There are major languages that interact with each other. What are you going to do with that? How do you deal with that? Nobody, human brains, our brains are not designed to deal with all these languages. So we have a logistical problem, which might be stated as how do we support someone who speaks only one modern language so that that person interacts with sources in any of these 20 historical languages that may be published in any combination of the other seven modern languages? Uh, that's the real engineering problem that we, and intellectual problem that we face. Or specifically, a speaker of Chinese sees Oliver Stone's Alexander, which is a much better movie than I thought it, was, it would be when I actually watched it this year, and wants to work with information in English, French, German, and Italian about sources in Greek and Latin. And there you have a lot of people watching a cultural production in China, and some of them would be interested. A lot of people watching things in the United States who would like to understand what's going on in the classical Chinese sources that underlie what they see. How do you make people get into the habit of thinking, well, of course I can find those sources. Of course I can think about that culture. Of course I can ask questions. Uh, and it's not just a black box. And to, cult to develop in people the idea that we are fundamentally connected and that we can think about the problems that we share. Or to put it you know, more specifically, how do you start from an object of cultural, a broad cultural interest and get into the, the deepest uh, sources without intellectual compromise, without dumbing anything down. And nobody really wants anything dumbed down. Uh, professors think they do, but they, real people, when they care about stuff, want it all. 
and they don't, and they, if they really get interested, there's always, everybody has something where they don't want any compromise, uh, and they want to get down to the, to the nitty gritty. And we have a lot of sources, uh, a lot of projects that float around that are, the, are basically the same, but they're just autonomous, and they don't interact. This is a project on old French. Everything in this screen is, this, is as far as I can tell, and our analysis is the same as you would be interacting with Greek or Latin or Arabic uh, or a Hittite. Uh, but it's a self-standing silo of information, and it's a self-standing system. How do we break out of that? Now let's shift and just say, how are what people, what languages do people actually study? And I'll talk about historical languages, which is my I prefer this to the other term of dead languages, uh, which is sounds pejorative. If you work in Native American studies, uh, you have a wonderful way of describing those, which I find much more attractive, and you will refer to sleeping languages. Uh, with the idea that even though you've lost your language, the language of your ancestors, someday you may bring it back into use. Especially now that we know, from the cognitive scientists, that you can actually have a, you know, a home language and in other languages in school and lose nothing cognitively, contrary to what was thought. So what historical languages are studied? And, I, uh, and by historical languages, I'm referring here to the sort of historical languages in this sort of Europe, Asia, African glomp, you know, a big clump. Uh, and now for Latin, in the United States, there's 138,000 people took the National Latin exam last year. That's a fairly large number. That's the best number we have, I guess, for, the, for how many people study Latin in high school. Perseus traffic, we got about 350,000 uh, unique visitors a month, and about 10% of them read Greek and Latin based on where they, what things they look at. Uh, and, and you have an MLA report on enrollments in languages other than, Latin, than English. Uh, Greek and Latin actually show up on the map. They're, Latin is in between Arabic and Russian. Uh, and Greek is in there, makes it. So it's pretty surprising. But the question I asked is how many of these historic, how many, these are all languages, how many historical languages uh, with 50 or more students are taught? Uh, and there's only 11. That are, that in which 50 or more students are reported to have been studying these languages in 2009, the fall of 2009. So the MLA statistics, it's going to under-report small, lightly studied languages, but it's probably a reasonable representation uh, of the grand scheme of things. So there are 11 languages, and most of the, of the thing categories here are duplicates of Greek and Hebrew and Latin, you know, basically the same category being counted multiple times. And in fact, what you see is that the study of the past is still, in the, in the United States, is dominated by the hegemony of what I would call the Renaissance Big Three historical languages, which are the three languages I grew up thinking I should know, uh, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Uh, and so if you look at just Greek and Latin, uh, in 2009, uh, they accounted for 77% of all enrollments in these historical languages. If you toss in biblical Hebrew, you get to 96%, which to me was a shocking figure. 96% of anyone studying an historical language is looking at one of these three languages. Because I'm used to seeing Sanskrit, classical Chinese. I see people doing this. I didn't realize that in the grand scheme of things, they were so um, uh, underrepresented and there was such domination. Uh, and you get, this reflects the economics of intellectual life. So in December of this year, I was having a conversation with a dean of a, I guess the research one doesn't get used anymore, but a research institution. Uh, and we were talking, and he has a plan, a plan about using resources better, which you have to do if you're a dean, because the people paying real money uh, and real tuition, you know, and it, it's expensive for them. And you have to allocate resources as best you can. And at one point, he said, oh, thank God, I don't want any more damn courses on uh, five people on Coptic. Coptic being an ancient language in Egypt, the language of Egyptian Christianity. And of course, I, my reaction is, what? You have five people who want to study Coptic? Aren't you, don't you put this in the newspaper and say what a great job you're doing? That you've got this, that, they, that the purpose of the, of the university to cultivate an illicit interest in the past and beautiful interest in the past is being fulfilled at your institution. There are five people, let's have a parade. Uh, but of course, it, it, you know, he's thinking about allocating resources and he's been beaten up by the state legislature and he doesn't have that freedom. Uh, and he feels that way too. But because of the, you know, the way we're organized, it is hard to support 
the five-person class, however meritorious it is. And in fact, the way if you draw a curve of uh, representing the distribution of enrollments, uh, you see it basically, it's not a curve, it just crashes. You go from 32,000 for Latin to 22,000 to Greek to, what is it, 13,000 for Biblical Hebrew down into the hundreds. Just bang, off the table. You go, you drop two orders of magnitude uh, instantaneously. Uh, and this, you know, where does this, this, this what, you know, where does this kind of distribution come from? Well, if you actually look now at, what, at things like Amazon or iTunes and what's called the long tail, what you discover looking at marketing, yes, we do look at marketing, these classes are sometimes, uh, is that people's interest does not crash like this. Now, your traditional brick and mortar you know, bookstore, much lamented, your traditional record store, uh, can only stock a small, relatively small number of items and can only stock things that will sell a certain number of items per year because everything, space costs money. Uh, and the, the tyranny of space means you have a relatively tiny selection. And what happens is people think, well, everybody just wants the best sellers. In fact, when you have iTunes, you have Amazon, and you have vast amounts of material, uh, most of the demand is actually not in the best sellers, or half of the demand is not in the best sellers, it's out here in this long tail. And half of your money gets earned from things that, smell, that sell in very small multiples. And that this, in fact, represents much more fairly human interest and human curiosity than this you know, catastrophic, you know, it's not a curve, it's a crash uh, that we represent here. What this says is that your university the this way we structure the teaching of languages and of all do topics in the university does not match human interest. And if you do not match human interest, people will not be as interested in what you are doing. You're not going to do as an effective job of convincing people that you're serving what they're interested in doing. In other words, it's the old Henry Ford Model T. You can have any color you want so long as it's black, uh, you know, kind of thing. So. You know, and here the idea is that the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the, the content gives you, or 20% of the content gives you 80% of the benefit doesn't work. So how do you serve long tail learning? How do you build a university that allows people to, under, to pursue those topics for which they develop genuine intellectual passion uh, in a way that is sustainable? Uh, and that's a real challenge. It's one of the great challenges, but if you are able to accomplish this goal, then you will better realize your mission, your obligation as a land grant, your, your privilege to serve in a land grant institution where you are charged to serve society in a way that those of us in private institutions cannot claim. Uh, and so even though the, the, you know, the, the, the governor beats you up on a regular basis, the good side is you, know, you actually are, have a real mandate to do good things. Where languages and you could substitute different subjects here, but languages, I mean, I'm a sucker for dead languages, excuse me, sleeping languages. Uh, and this is really what you want, is to, to have teaching and scholarship that much better reflects what we believe interests would be. Now, how much scholarly labor? How do you support all these languages? How do you build the infrastructure that you need to, the digital infrastructure you need to actually teach people and support discourse? Well, there's not that much money in the NSF, but if you look at scholarly publications just in classics, uh, you will find that we have, do I skip on to it? There are about 12,000 new publications a year in our bibliography. And if you assume a month of labor per publication, which I hope there is, uh, then you've got about 1,000 years of labor. Uh, and you figure it's about $100,000 to pay for a professor, including overhead and, and benefits and so on when you're done with it. Uh, per year, so that's about a thousand men or person years, and what is that? You know, a lot of money, a uh, hundred million dollars of resources of faculty time that are going into re into research, and some subset of that, you know, you could deploy here. Uh, and if you think in terms of the of the again, again this hegemony of the Renaissance big three languages, just how much money goes into these little languages uh, in terms of tuition? Now, the average tuition. Uh, in, the, in 2009, for all categories of university, $17,000. If 
Those of you who are paying $5,000 to come here, you know, I'm paying, well, you don't want to know how much I'm paying for my son to go to college. So uh, it's money, but it, you could be worse. 17,000 is the absolute average. Uh, according to the Department of Education, you have thus and so many, you know, this many people taking courses, classes, you divide by eight, and you basically come up with a figure that you are making, that your tuition investment in the big three languages is $300 million a year for Greek, Latin, and Biblical Hebrew. So this is the money that people are spending. This is a way, this is, these are the resources that you should be able to tap into to do a better job of doing what you were doing. And this is the money that you have to tap into and redeploy so that you can build the infrastructure for Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, which you can then transfer to Sanskrit, to classical Ch Chinese, to Old Norse, to uh, cl classical Arabic, uh, and my hope is also to Native American languages as well. Uh, you get economies of scale, but it requires a different way of thinking. Okay, and what are some of the resources uh, that exist to think about rebuilding, building an infrastructure to support, to support the breadth of interests that people have. And if you're going to model this kind of infrastructure, you have to start with those languages you know, where, you, you, where you know something, a lot of data. Greek and Latin actually have a lot of stuff that's available and it's free. And so to some extent, Greek and Latin are the um, you know, laboratory for, for in which you would build the, you know, just have to build the general space to look at lots of other languages. And it's an obligation, it's not a privilege. Uh, this is how those of us who are classes must think, because we have a responsibility for taking our resources and using them to help other disciplines. There's a lot of stuff in CC license. Uh, a phenomenon, now another big phenomenon that's happened is we live in a huge world, but the amount of data available to us, the, amount of, no, the number of sources available is vast. I don't have a slide of it, but I can tell you that the net public, and I define the net public as those people who have access to the internet, uh, exceeded in 2011 2.2 billion. 2.2 billion, that's one third of humanity. Uh, and you, know, you say, well, they're all on broadband. Well, no, uh, but they can all get text. Uh, and a lot of them are on broadband. So one third of humanity if you put something online, anyone from one third of humanity has a shot at getting at it. There's never been any, that's not one third of the people in the United States. That's one third of the human race. That's an unbelievable number. Uh, and, and that one third of humanity has access, physical access in some fashion, to more of the human record today, an open access, more of the human record than any scholar had 20 years ago. And that's intellectual, physical access, but how, what do you do with it? You know, what do you, how do you use what you can find is the big question. Here, just to take us, you know, go, to, go back to a small subject, Latin, we, we actually went through and analyzed the first million books we could download from the Internet Archive, which stole a bunch of them from Google. Uh, this is being recorded. You no, know, so which borrowed in a bunch of them from Google. Now, oh, God bless you. Um, uh, Anyway, uh, they, we found three billion words of Latin. Now, the, the corpus, the canon of Latin, the stuff anyone ever talks about uh, and writes articles about, 20 years, would be, 20 years ago would be about five million words. Uh, all of Latin that survives through 600 is about 50 million words. And now you have three billion words anybody can see. And once anybody can see it, there's the demand to say, well, what am I looking at? It's an inexhaustible sea of, of data that no one can interpret. No one's really looked at for the most part. Uh, and you know, I'll skip over these. Uh, and the point of this, this slide is that library metadata isn't very useful. According to this slide, this shows that the books Cicero and Livy and the other Roman, history, Roman writers wrote in the 19th century, uh, is, which is what the library catalog will tell you, because the books were printed in the 19th century. So, how do you, in fact, when you analyze the dates, uh, you get most of the Latin in the world is post-classical. This is the language of the history of Europe. This is also the language you wrote in when you said, I am not Italian, I am not German, I am not French, I am European. And I ascribe to a, an identity where we don't kill each other over language. 
uh, and it is the, sort of some of the nicest qualities of Europe uh, emerge when you're writing Latin. Or as a friend of mine from Croatia says, quoting the old internet cartoon, a woman that says, on the internet nobody knows you're a dog. Uh, and my friend from the University of Zagreb said, in the early modern period when everybody wrote in Latin, nobody knew you were Cro Croatian. Because when he writes in Croatian in his mother language, you know, like three million people can read him. And for him to have an audience, he has to assume a hegemonic, the language of a more politically powerful uh, and culturally powerful uh, group, like English or Italian or German. So for him, for someone in a small country, uh, vernaculars were not a win. Okay. Now, where does your labor come from? What other sources of labor? And what is this is a part of this is a blog, a 2008 blog, quoted in a wonderful book called Reality is Broken. Uh, and it has my favorite statistic of the year. Uh, and it, it says how, many, how much time it takes for the average U player to get to the top level of the world of Warcraft. Now, World of Warcraft is a lot of style. It's gone from 12 million to merely 10 million subscribers. Uh, and, uh, but it's a you know, massively multiplayer game. Uh, and so and the, the, the blog is saying another, another game only requires you know, 250 hours to reach, to get to the end of. So 500 hours of in-game experiences, apparently what this person claims is the, how long it takes the average person to get to the highest level of the World of Warcraft, which is where you actually start enjoying the game the most. That's when you really are humming. I know, able to go on all sorts of great missions and doing stuff. You know, that's what, that's what these guys say. And of course, he got through there in 330 hours. Uh, and, you know, maybe more reliable statistics from the Nielsen uh, company, the number of average number of minutes people spend uh, on different games a year ago. What is this? June 2011. You know, Halo, the average Halo player spends 700 minutes a week. So the 500-hour number is pretty plausible. Now, let's just think about what 500 hours means. So I think of it in terms of semesters. A semester is roughly 15 weeks, really 13 weeks. Let's say 15. Uh, and two semesters a year, 30 weeks. And then 15 hours, 16 hours a week, you get up to 450, 500 hours. And those aren't 500 hours of, of like, people sitting in class or you probably thinking about, you know, why do you come to this lecture? Uh, it's, it's 500 hours of people, their brains firing, of complete engagement, uh, of focus. <coughs> you give me 500 hours of that intensity, and I'll give you someone who knows a language, has the foundations of a language quite solidly, and is prepared to do extraordinary things. <coughs> so how do you get 500 hours uh, that people might play on the world of Warcraft so they can carry out missions in a virtual space that people will get bored with at some point in the future and transfer that over to say working with an under, contributing to our understanding of the past and contributing to a, to a, to a international conversation that extends across time, language, culture uh, and reaches every corner of humanity. How do you get there? And I think how do you use this labor? Or let me put it another way does anyone want to argue that the study of ancient languages, the philology, the study of the past is not a game? Uh, and there are, there are various ways to, to, to define games, but all of them fit what I do. And why don't we, how do you use this? Uh, how do you take advantage of this? So how do you represent the ancient game of philology, which is a study of historical languages in a 21st century form? Well, you go do a bunch of incredibly boring technical analyses of things which look like this, which are really good uh, to make you look serious. Uh, and you draw incomprehensible diagrams with stick figures of people dancing around and arrows pointing in all directions uh, as a fetish object to show that you are able to abstract thought. And, and, no, and people have to fund you if you put that there, because otherwise they have to understand what you wrote. Uh, and so it's easier just to give you the money. Uh, and this is a general diagram. This is kind of the stuff we could build today. Uh, and, but what's really going on here? Uh, and this is a, one of the things I've done is I've had a real privilege to talk to the members of the classics department here, both faculty and students, uh, and, and at other institutions. And one of the things that we've faced in dealing with the past, especially with the past that's encoded in languages that we do not 
normally would understand uh, is it's taken two years. You say, well, if you work for two years, if you work for a year of, of Greek in college, you can read an attic orator's legal speeches, get through one of them, which is actually pretty cool. I mean, if you're struggling through Hanson, the, the textbook. But, there's a, but then you're going kind of slowly, and there's this huge delayed reward. But the fact is that we're now in a position where anyone who walks into a college classroom should be able to work with linguistic sources in languages which they have not studied. That does not mean you're fluently reading classical Chinese. It means you're able to go in and work with a text in Greek and Sanskrit, Arabic, Chinese, whatever, uh, and do something with it and work directly with the language. Uh, and that, once you, and that it, is a, in, it is a gradual process as you get more proficient. But you're immediately working with things. So another, another diagram, more diagrams. Let's just get this thing concrete. This is an example of uh, a reading environment called Alpheus that some friends of mine and, and partners have developed. Uh, and it has just a really trivial feature, uh, which you can now see in some elements of Google Translate. Uh, but here, if you mouse over any word in the English or any word in the Greek, then the corresponding word in the Greek or the English will highlight, will show up. And those correspondences were calculated automatically. So you're able to say, well, it's like, you know, what does this word mean? You point your mouse at it, and you see the corresponding translation. Uh, you can create what people, students of Greek and Latin, were familiar with in the, 18th, in the 19th century when everybody had to study Greek and Latin. You created what are called interlinear translations, where you would have the Greek, and the, the English words would be underneath each Greek or Latin word. You can do that automatically. And the point is, then, you know, not only do you get rough translation equivalents, but you can say, well, what is the linguistic function of every word? What, word, what does this word mean in the dictionary? What form is this word? What's its grammatical function? And then you can say, well, how, does the sentence, how is the sentence organized? What's the subject? What's the object? How do the words fit together? Well, once you start having all of this information available in a single integrated space, there's no reason you can't go into you know, the Odyssey of Homer uh, or you know, the, a, a text in Sanskrit or a text in classical Arabic you know, and figure out what every single word means. And then you can do other things like say, well, this word's translated in English as love. What does it really mean? And you look at 50 instances, and you realize it corresponds to this word in Greek, eros, and it's sexual desire in Plato. And then you see love, this word translated love in the Christian New Testament corresponds to agape. And if you look at 50 instances of that, you say, wow, that's not sexual desire. That's something different, whatever it is. Uh, and all, once you've done that, You've gone right past the barriers of the English translation, and you're inside the language looking out. And that's something you can do in a freshman survey of 250 students. And that is a qualitatively different experience from their reading textbooks and translations, which are opaque and tell you you can't get any further. And so you start like this, and you can say, oh, knock yourself out. You know, read, look up every word you can read anything. And some subset of people are going to say, wow, this is really cool. Uh, and let's build, now we give you a gaming environment where we, we let you see if you can figure this stuff out for yourself, let you learn what you need to learn, practice it, and develop the speed and accuracy, accuracy iteratively so you can read with, the, with fluency. And frankly, you'll understand what fluency means when you've looked up every word in 10 words or 10 lines of poetry and got sick of it. This is a way to change the relationship of people to uh, fundamentally change the relationship between the language, our sources in the past, and, and society in general. Uh, it's also, we have methods now where we're publishing different interpretations uh, in these machine actionable forms. And here are the interpretations of two scholars who never saw a computer in their lives, uh, who interpreted the same sentence of Aeschylus in different ways and hated each other for it. Actually, there are three scholars involved. Uh, and, uh, but this is, we can now, if we represent these, these same interpretations in a machine actionable form, where we can compare these two tree structures and see which one seems to be a better fit, uh, a more plausible interpretation of the sentence. Uh, and in, we can actually develop our learning. The way we can teach language now is we can teach people languages by having them contribute to knowledge bases. So as you study, your, learn your intermediate Arabic or, or Chinese or Greek or Latin, 
uh, you're going in and analyzing sentences that no one else has analyzed. Your analyses are compared with those of your classmates. If, they're, if you agree, you're probably right, but maybe not. Your professor comes and looks at what you've done. Uh, you have a conversation about where you differ. You arrive at a common understanding uh, as to what the interpretation of the sentence is. And then ha you have not just done your homework. You have added a sentence to what is the equivalent of the genome uh, for the study of an historical language that will be useful for 100 years. And then you can go home and watch you know, TV. Uh, or you can go home and do what you do as a student, you know, what I did as a student, too. Uh, except the drinking age was 18 when I was um, a student. So I, I hope it's a little different now. <clears throat> anyway, this is, it is a very different thing when you are taking second semester Latin and you are contributing, you are not just trying to get a grade, but you have an opportunity to contribute as a citizen of a, not just a subject of a Kafka-esque imperium or of, of learning, uh, but you're a citizen who has rights and obligations and opportunities to contribute and to have a voice that grows ever more powerful as you move forward or to go to the gamification metaphor to level up. Uh, as you start answering questions uh, and, and working with, with, you know, in this interactive fashion, we can start seeing what students are good at what. And so here's a representation of, of, of a class, two different, of, of one class and students interacting with two different grammatical functions. I won't get into the details here, but basically you can see immediately certain students have trouble with this thing and they should work on that. Other students have trouble with something else. And this is a custom way for an instructor or for students to see where they need work and where they don't need work. So you can personalize their instruction delivered, the learning, so people are always doing what they need to do. Which again, people are rational. People aren't stupid. You know, people want to go spend their time effectively. And the more effectively you spend your time, the more appealing, you know, maybe I'm too rational, I think the more appealing it is. And there are more cool things you can do. Um, uh, I just, this is a favorite of mine. This is my midterm exam uh, from this fall. And so I took, taught a class on Greek, Arabic, and Latin. Uh, and it's the, the basic idea of the class, which is I, I could go on for an hour or full semester about, was that more Greek science gets translated into Arabic from 800 to 1000 CE than into all modern European languages since. And, and has an immense impact upon stimulating in original science and research in Arabic speaking, er, in Arabic publications. Then when the Europe, Western Europeans started reading again, or reading more widely, I guess, statistically, uh, you know, in about the 1200, they didn't have a lot of written books. And so what they did was they realized, oh, everything's been translated into Arabic. So Aristotle, Euclid, uh, uh, Galen, returned to Europe not from the Greek. They returned to Europe from translations out of Arabic into Latin. And when the Europeans had access to translations directly from the Greek, they didn't want them. Because what the Arabic, writing, Arabic scholars had done made the Greek scholarship much more useful to them. And that you would not be here without work done in Baghdad in 900, 800 to 1000 CE. There would not have been the so-called Renaissance without the processes that were set in motion uh, stimulated by ideas that came from Arabic into Latin. And so we looked at Greek, Arabic, and Latin versions of Aristotle's poetics. Uh, and their assignment was to take, the, and half the class had studied Greek, half the class had studied Arabic. And the people who studied Arabic lined up the words by manually in the Arabic text with an English translation. The people who studied Greek, Greek took the same English translation, they lined up the words with the Greek. Second step. Figure out, you look at, the, go from the Greek to the Arabic, and yes, I know you don't know both languages, but you've got an English translation there in the middle. You write to me and tell me which translation, the Greek or the English, is closer to the Arabic. And talk to me about something about the impact of translating Greek into Arabic and what the consequences are for the shape of Aristotle. And guess what? Everybody could do it. Everybody had something interesting to say. They were working with a language, a hard language they had never studied and deriving substantive uh, you know, observations. And the result is also we have these aligned texts, which I can clean up and publish as a data set that will improve automatic analysis people can use. So this was like collaborative, a collaborative uh, uh, assignment that led to uh, an advance, in a small but, but tangible advance in human understanding, uh, where people did something that was physically impossible. 
I think it's just, it's just fabulous. Okay, so let's look, go quickly through some other things. Um, one of the great things about Greek and Latin is we have reading lists. And I'm big fans of reading lists. They sort of they challenge you. They say that even though you can find a professor who will give you an easy class and not make you work very hard, it's usually me. Uh, and uh, you you know you still have to read a lot of Greek and Latin. And it doesn't matter if you get an A or an A minus. Because we're going to give you an exam on this reading list, and you have to get through the reading list. You have to figure out how to do it. It's great for some responsibility. You know, and the problem is, A, what's, what does that mean? What, what is, what's in that? It means that's cool stuff. You can look at it, and there's Homer and Hesiod and Pindar and really cool Greek authors some of you have heard of. Uh, but, you know, operationally, what does that mean? Uh, well, now all these texts are online, so you can have a reading list that's dynamic. Uh, and here, this is the same reading list, but we've gone through and we've just basically counted how many words are there in the first book of the Iliad, in the ninth book of the Iliad, in Odyssey, nine, Odyssey books 9 to 12. There's 4,500 words, 5,000 words, 16,000 words, etc. raw words. How many vocabulary entries are there in each of these chunks of text? And how much vocabulary you have to know. Which those of you who know language, it's, grammar is not that hard. It's the, Latin, the vocabulary that kills you in the end. Uh, and then, so how much vocabulary? How much new vocabulary? So the more you read, the more, the less, fewer words that you see will be new. And so how do you measure your progress through the language, your ability to actually read without looking things up? You read with fluency. And you can see, in fact, you, in, the, in their first, as you go through the first book of the Iliad, by the time you finished, the average, 25% the, of the time, the words that you, are, you have looked up uh, are new. Because, you know, and then you get to the second, the book nine of the Iliad is 15%, goes down to 10%. And by the time you've worked your way through a third of an, the undergraduate reading list for Yale, which still has an undergraduate reading list, a third of the reading list, you've, you will recognize, you'll recognize 96% of all the words you're reading, which tells you you're basically at fluency. You can read, then you understand the text that you're looking at without making much recourse to a dictionary, which means you can read it. Uh, well, and the more, so this is, this is something we never knew before. How much do you have to read? Uh, and the more you read, the better your skills are. So say you have a published reading list. Yale is the last classics department that has a reading list for Greek and Latin. Harvard gave up. They ran up the white flag, to my dismay. Uh, so say you go look at the Yale reading list here at the U of F. You say, I'm going to use that. And then maybe you say, I'm going to read more than that. I'm, I'm going to read 200,000 words of Greek, not 150,000 words of Greek. How do you could actually document that? You, in other words, you could, and this leads us now to the real question of how do you keep score, and I'm going to shift now to assessment, and a limited kind of assessment, undergraduate assessment. But how do you represent what, what you've learned? Uh, and this is actually really important. So annotation can be assessment. So when you're going through and analyzing the syntax and morphology of Greek words, Greek or Latin words, uh, you could actually use this as a metric for how well people understand the language. And just here are some numbers. And if you can do a really good job of this, you can translate. You really know the language. Uh, and how do, you, how do you represent what people have learned? And let me put this in another way. How do you separate the value of, your, of, what, of what you've learned as a student from the brand name of your institution? How do you allow the merit, how do you document to the world what you did, not where you came from? And that's really what we're thinking about. How do you let people you know, chain, you know, rise on their own merit? And so e-portfolios, electronic portfolios, are one way of doing this. And they, they're a way of keeping score, of providing you the equivalent of your game it's like turning this into a game in a sort of constructive way. And you want to demonstrate what have you contributed to knowledge and what skills have you developed. And we have today, you know, we, you know it's engineering to be done, but we can, we can do this. So here, for example, going back to these syntactic analyses I talked about briefly, here are two sentences of Homer that you can download that will be in a, in a permanent repository that are part of like the equivalent of the genome uh, for the study of Greek. And there are three names for each sentence. One name is the name of an undergraduate, a Holy Cross. One name is a master's candidate uh, at Tufts University. And the other name is an expert in Homer who looked at where the two students, the other annotators, differed 
and corrected it, and the three names together get credit for those sentences. And so we can then go and say, well, who did what? You know, who contributed to this how many sentences? How do you make this part of your port? Well, what you, what, what you collect as a student. So just as a natural course of things, if you do a lot of work and you contribute a lot to this project, it shows up uh, when, you go, when you apply to go to medical school, where you learn 30,000 technical terms, by the way, and your study of Greek and Latin is incredibly useful, not just uh, because of uh, etymology, but because you have to train your brain to learn a lot uh, to be a good doctor. Uh, you can't look it up when you're in the operating room, uh, as my dean of, of education at the medical school likes to tell me. Uh, but here you demonstrate, you know, how do you demonstrate this? E-portfolio is also or a way of changing what assignments look like. So here is uh, an assignment of an old medieval Latin class that uh, where my colleague, Marie-Claire Bullio, said we're not just going to read medieval Latin, we're going to find someone no, one, no one's ever translated before, and we're going to divide it up, and each of us is going to take a piece, and we're going to tr translate part of it. And then we're going to put the pieces that we've translated after we've graded them and gone over them, put them in the Tufts Digital Library, where they pres be preserved for 100 years and made available to anyone of the 2.2 billion people on the web who happens to be interested. Uh, and that's your, the outcome of your project. So if you just think I'm going to give you an A, and it doesn't, you know, your grandmother may look at it uh, and say that your English stinks uh, or something along those lines. It changes the nature of the assignment. And so, but how do you integrate this in so it's just part of, it's not something you do as a separate project, it's part of your education. Uh, a great project, another project like this is called the Homer Multitext, where, these, where undergraduates are editing medieval manuscripts uh, and I had a conversation again today at dinner where someone asked me the question I asked myself, how can undergraduates do this? It's too hard. Uh, and I, I go every so often and watch them and they actually do it because they have been entrusted with a task and the expectation that they will succeed. Uh, their results are public. They work together. Uh, and it is something which they own and they do it actually as a club. Uh, how do you represent these contributions uh, you know, in a rational way? And then finally, you know, these, these dynamic reading lists um, that I talked about, where when you graduate with a classics degree or degree in Greek from the University of Florida, you can say, here's what I learned, here's my examination corpus. And in fact, if you compare it to the Yale reading list, I read 50% more uh, because I think it's really cool and I'm smarter than those guys. Uh, or, you know, whatever. Uh, and when you want to go to graduate school or, med or law school or medical school, you can use that as you should be able to. All right. If they finish it up quickly, how do we get there from here? Lots of projects, lots of projects, cool stuff, cool stuff. Uh, you know, lots of more incomprehensible things. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't do these diagrams. I can't do it. I love them. They always get us funded. Can we delete that from the transcript? Uh, but the, they are really useful. Um, uh, and I'm going to finish with an incomprehensible German quotation. Uh, I like using this because I can say anything I want because hardly anybody understands it. Uh, but it's actually, I, get, I had a chance to give uh, a talk at the Berlin and Brandenburg Academy of Sciences in December, excuse me, January. And it, was very, and it was very moving to me because classicists, a lot of our history happens uh, within a stone's throw of that building uh, in Berlin. Uh, and great people work there. And I read through uh, an essay entitled On the Responsibilities of an Historian by Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, who, in, who founded what, what is now Humboldt University and was then University of Berlin, and really invented, largely invented the modern research library, research university. One of the things I discovered in reading about Humboldt was that uh, his idea about a university was, it was if you were at a university, you were creating knowledge. Uh, that if you were just learning at stuff from a textbook, that wasn't university education. So all my radical ideas that everybody has to be contributing knowledge from the beginning turns out to be 200 years old. Uh, and Humboldt was saying this when he invented the university. It's kind of cool to discover that. Uh, and then he, when he talks about what Thucydides um, is trying, or excuse me, what, what a university is trying to do, he actually quotes Thucydides, or paraphrases my man Thucydides, the funeral oration at one point, uh, and, and says it's about making this, the individual uh, able to contribute, as, to be as developed intellectually as possible and to create a better society 
from that intellectual, that individual education and to contribute to the whole so the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, which is one of the reasons why Pericles argues that democracy is so wonderful. But in the end, I found this long quote. And basically, the quote, it, you know, it, it's, it's a quote that would sound almost banal now, because the basis is, what are we trying to do? We're trying to pursue this one idea, or we're trying to move beyond one-sided ideas and prejudices that put people of different races and colors and religions against each other and to emphasize instead the, the overarching commonality of humanity and the fact that we are connected uh, and that we, have, we are one, that humanity is more important than any subgroup. Now that sounds like, uh, you, know, you could make fun of that as the old enlightenment, that's, or could say that's pap. On the other hand, I had a chance to, to, to talk about this at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy 25 years ago, that was the German Democratic uh, Republic uh, Academy of Sciences. It was, the, it was right over the, the wall in East Germany. Uh, 70 years before, the jackboots marched up and down uh, under Dane Linden, five minutes walk away. Uh, if you were Tim Tebow, uh, you could throw a football from the entrance uh, of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy, and even you could hit uh, the square uh, where uh, the books were burned, uh, next to the opera across the street from Humboldt University. Humboldt was kicked out by the king, fired uh, for his ideas. Uh, but his university was built. And even though you can have unimaginable things happen, uh, and when you were there, and people started crying, we were thinking about it, uh, nevertheless, these ideals of liberal education, these ideas of what it is, why we pursue the humanities, why we do what we do, they, they, they survive barbarity, they sur genuine barbarity, they survive in history and they resurge and they're back. Uh, and they, they are, are unstoppable. Uh, and I believe in fact they actually cumulatively grow stronger. And so we, the challenges that we face now, the budget cuts, the, the, the skepticism, the cynicism, these are all opportunities and challenges uh, that we can use to rethink what we're doing and why it is that we're, we're pursuing the humanities, why it is we're looking at the past, why it is we learn these ancient languages, and why it's so important to enable people to do it. Uh, so I think it is, I was asked, I'll finish by saying, I was asked yesterday, whether I would, or day before yesterday, by my colleagues, would I like to be a classics graduate student? Now, or 10 years ago, or 100 years ago, or whatever, and I said, you, I couldn't imagine a better time to be a rising humanist than today. For, and, for, and precisely for the very challenges that you face, which allow you to think and rethink what you're doing and to make more fully those, the arguments for that which we wish to accomplish with a force that would not happen if you were just handed the positions uh, that we received in the past. So thank you very much. I mean, you, you start where you can do a word-for-word -word equivalency, and then, in, then you see other places you can't. That's when it gets interested. But yes, it, it's, it builds on that. That's, that's fine. It's fascinating. Yeah. But you have to, for historical text, there is a historical dimension. You've got to know where the text has come from, mm -hmm. who copied it, or mm -hmm. how it compares with other versions. Uh, there's a whole other dimension of paleontology and other sciences that come into establishing a text even before you translate it. Absolutely. And how does that fit into the new program of learning that you're proposing? Let me go back to the project I skipped blithely over 
uh, which is this Homer multi-text project, which is one example. Uh, now, people, medievalists, beat classicists up with good reason to say, you classicists, you, all you, you don't care about these manuscripts that we've got. All you care about is reconstructing some original text, and you throw all the, the, the history of the text out. Uh, and you're not thinking about the fact that, say, Homer isn't just, well, let's not do Homer because it wasn't necessarily an original text. The Republic of Plato isn't just something that a person wrote, it may have written at one time, but it has its own history, uh, the manuscripts of which it was a, which encoded it were produced at different times by different people with different reasons, and they were part of entire worlds and archaeological contexts and historical contexts. I totally agree. And one, this one example is a piece of this. It doesn't answer your whole question. But it, this is a project where students are, re, are editing manuscripts of Homer uh, with all the annotation, ancient scholarship around them, and they're thinking about this is a 10th century you know, $100,000 copy of Homer from Byzantium that then was rescued and captured or carried over to Venice before the fall of Byzantium. That's a whole different story which students are now looking at that they never looked at before. And in fact, people said, it, again, it's still hard for us to believe that the students are reading scholiastic Byzantine Greek and thinking about this different context. Now, the whole context, you know, my, my favorite term, this phrase for philology is by Augustus Burke. Uh, from Germany also, who was, who was in the University of Berlin, who described it as the cognitio totius antiquitatis, which is the understanding of, of so all of society, uh, and words happen to be part of it. But it includes archaeology, art, every discipline. So I talk here because I've already talked way too long, <laughs> and, and people would, would, would fall over and fall asleep if I did everything. I, and I talk for shorthand just about the language and, and really simplify, but it's, you're quite entirely right. It is much more complicated than that. And so I agree, if that's an answer. Yes. Hi. I, so I, I kind of, um, I mean, I, I find so much of this so you know, appealing. And um, I, I think that these can be really important um, pedagogical tools. Um, I mean, by training as an, as an art historian, and so, you know, the possibility that you can expose students to original source texts and original materials in this way, um, use, you know, the technologies to kind of instantiate these kind of material works is, is deeply appealing. I guess my question to you about um, much of the presentation is, you know, I, I do have this worry about um, interpretation, right? <laughs> Um, and the task of um, the humanities as a place where a kind of agility of thought gets trained. And I think in all sorts of different ways that happens, right? But, but on, the, on some other kind of level, I, 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 there, there's something about, and it goes to the kind of question of how do we get at you know, this kind of expansive, you know, interpretive endeavor that you have to engage in in order to translate and not just simply correlate. And I think there's different steps and different you know, levels that you're, you're engaging with when these models present to us. Um, but I guess I, I do have those kinds of worries about how this would be a kind of, how do we get to the kind of sustainable model where um, you know, it's, it's, it, some of this feels like, you know, in my mind, how, how can we differentiate what these activities are in this kind of game that they're playing from data processing? I mean, you talk about the productive production and the generation of data sets. And, you know, the difference between that and producing something like a critical edition, right, uh, involves a different kind of activity of interpretation on a closer level. So I was wondering if you could address that. Well, you know, and that's a critical, a critical edition is a, is, an inter is a good example, or you might be a... a where you traditionally you go through and you, you try and figure out what all, you have all these manuscripts and how do you organize the data in the manuscripts so you can reconstruct the original version. Uh, and a lot of that analysis is, in fact, technical. I mean, you go through and you're trying to figure out which is the earliest manuscript. And there are a number, you know, a guy named Lachman, who actually, I know you work on philology or German scholarships, you've probably heard of him, uh, developed stemmas, so you have a sort of a genetic relationship between things. So a lot of, a lot of the work is based upon observational analysis. It's like being in a lab. I mean, a lot of it is dismal stuff where you're 
uh, uh, going through and, and, and trying to do the cell-based assay today and get at the damn data points that, that are useful. And that's the foundation, though, for, you know, well, what does this mean? What is, what's going on in this text? Fundamentally, after these readings, which one do I think is a better representation of Latin? Or which one is more probable to have been what this person produced? Which is actually the challenge is you to model, uh, to develop a model of how this person's brain worked, essentially, uh, which includes full culture, literate, you know, a whole bunch of, 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 of cultural complexities that are very hard to do at an early stage. Uh, and so I think that the, uh, I think that you start with the, which you start with really some very ob things which may seem trivial or may seem very banal, uh, but that's your foundation. The beauty from my perspective of philology or the classics is that you, you end up talking about truth and beauty uh, in Plato or you're talking about, you know, the state versus the individual in Antigone, uh, you know, a life or death situation, but you're starting with, you know, future perfects in Greek. Uh, and what is the, well, okay, what do you think this word actually means? And let's talk about whether the, what, the, your interpretation of this word, you know, relate, how it relates to your analysis of the larger issues in the play, and you have that chain uh, which moves from the, from the observational, uh, almost the mechanical, up to, you know, something more complex where there is no, you know, doing value judgments. But the value judgments are, have some grounding in an understanding of language and culture, uh, and in fact, which, you, which is never complete because, you know, it's, it's so complicated. No one brain gets it all in their head. Uh, only when you're a graduate student do you have the, for, the, the privilege of thinking that you can know everything because you've reduced things down to something you can understand. So I think, the, so the answer, uh, the basic answer is I agree with you. You know, that's what we worry about. Uh, but I, I think that the resurgence of this range of tasks uh, and the complexity, the family of tasks and network of tax, tasks is really different and really interesting. And it's one that doesn't preclude the great questions, but one that allows you to enter into this larger discourse, just like you enter into a lab. And you start by doing something fairly mundane, and you, and, you know, and if you're lucky, you're running the big, the big lab and, at, and working on the big project, trying to address some aspect of human health or of energy or whatever, and thinking, you know, large thoughts, which are different from the thoughts that we think, but complex all the same. Yes. I, I, I'm thinking about this project, and I, I share what the concerns and the enthusiasm of the earlier questioners, and I, I keep thinking about one of better metaphor, a cart and a horse, or a chicken and egg problem. It strikes me that that the dramatic expansion, the multiplication of the text base, both feeds the strategies that you're talking about and requires the strategies that you're talking about, supports what you're doing, but also necessitates a change in the model of scholarship. It moves away from a kind of, uh, uh, for a better word again, romantic isolation of the knowledge of the text in a master subject who looks at this and says, well, I have complete fluency in the cultural and historical moment of the text, even though I am not Aristotle, but I am able to somehow interpret what's going on and make sense of it in a crucial way, translate and so on. You're shifting from that model, which is a model that probably hasn't really been workable since Francis Bacon, frankly. It was like the last guy that read everything that you could read, and then, you know, you're shifting from that model to a model that's really about distributed knowledge and recursive algorithms of knowledge. I mean, it strikes me that, you know, one of the things you talked about in the lunch thing the other day was teams of students who are working Collectively, not merely collaboratively, but the aggregates of their papers mm -hmm. are what are producing these recursively refined translations, the recursively refined models of investigation. The end result may be some expertise or degree of fluency or agility of mind on the part of the students, but the product is that it seems to me that, 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 that and this is sort of where I'm going with this observation that people question. You've got a different model of scholarship. You've got a model of scholarship that's no longer the fantasy of um, a single individual in deep meditation on a narrow set of texts. You've got a model of knowledge that is really distributed in precisely the form of a network. 
Mm -hmm. Again, the kids may come out with great skills, but the solutions to the problem have been moved across a giant group of individuals, no one of which possesses or needs to possess the appearance of mastery. The mastery, if such a thing is even conceivable anymore, accretes out of their combined labors. So, is scholarship in the humanities or the institutional forms of the humanities ready for a transfer from what is a model of the master reader to a model of reading taking place as a social process? I can't speak to you. you know, what is the abstract? Is scholarship, but you know, I'm ready. And let me give you an example. I come exactly out of the tradition of what you described. My, I was trained to, be, to, in, to develop the sole internalized interpretation that no one else could have of a text, and you could write it down, and it was yours. Uh, and that's in, in you know, Hannah Arendt. Uh, and I always, if I say Hannah Arendt, people say it's Arendt. And if I say Arendt, they say it's Arendt. And so you can't win. Uh, but whichever you, you choose. I, you know, I read, I, in reading her, I, I learned that about the distinction between strength versus power. Strength is what you have when you're the 300-pound linebacker uh, in the Gators. Uh, and you can run around, you can break any one person you want over your knee. Uh, that's the scholar. That's the isolated scholar. Power is what you have as an aggregate. When you are a team, where you're working together, that's the athletic model people get mad at. Uh, and I, I moved away from strength to power. So it used to be, is this my idea? Am I smart? Am I able to write something which is new, which is mine? Uh, and you know, I don't even know whose ideas I have anymore. Uh, and my great you know, ambition, I was talking about this at dinner, if I had to do one thing in life, uh, it would be able, you know, I had this whole thing about who was the most important class of the 20th century. It was the Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini, who studied Aristotle in graduate school and who invented, used Plato's Republic as the model for the Islamic Republic of Iran, which he did. Uh, and uh, so if you're sitting in the holy city of Qom uh, as a scholar, uh, and you're there saying, hey, you know, we read Plato, we looked at Athenian democracy, we set up these Athenian, these democratic institutions, you know, it didn't work so well in the last presidential campaign, so let's let that aside for now. Uh, and nobody's ever talked to us about this. You know, hello, we read Plato. Uh, we're neocons, you know, we're, you know, we're saving Western civilization. What, you know, why don't you talk to us? So to me, I would like to go be able to give a lecture in Farsi in the holy city of Qom and have a conversation about, about democracy with the mullahs who I may completely disagree with on everything, except they happen, I know that they were reading Plato and they were, they'd established de democratic institutions uh, based on the Greek model. Now, if you have a conversation between people who speak Farsi and us, I, and all of a sudden they realize they're, we're listening to them uh, and that we actually are interested in what they did, and we, even if we disagree with them. Uh, I come from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I you know, totally disagree. Uh, but nevertheless, you, know, you recognize what they did. That would be more valuable than anything I'm ever going to write because what that does is it changes the re social relationship between two collections of subjects, uh, and then the fact of having a nuclear weapon in Iran becomes a very different thing. Because if you're talking to them about your interpretation of Plato, well, actually, if you're scholars, you probably would know each other. But, but you know, if you have civil discourse, uh, you, you're probably less likely to get even to get to the entertain the notion that you're going to, you know, do terrible things to each other, except write nasty reviews of each other's work, uh, you know, which is. So I, I, I really think, I used to, I remember hearing, well, it's all about conversations and discourse. And I said, bah, it's about writing brilliant articles and getting stuff into elite journals so you can become a fancy scholar someplace and you're really smart. I don't believe that anymore. I believe it's about it, you, the, the use of this knowledge, the use of, this, of, of, of learning is the, the real impact are the exchanges of ideas between people and the relationships which they create which are the, the sort of the, and the relationships that change from sort of tribal or narrow self-isolating views of cultural heritage where it's mine, the Greeks are ours, you know, or I, you know, classical Chinese is mine, or I'm from this culture or from that culture and everybody else is wrong, to, well, we got these guys, who do you have? And our guys talk to each other and, you know, they sort of, you did this, you did that, that's interesting. Or, or you were in this part of the world, we were isolated, and how do, let's, let's talk about it. 
where you have an exchange of ideas, which is a foundation of civilization. So our job is, to, is not to write articles, it's to build civilization, and civilization ends up with people talking to each other. Uh, and it's kind of naive, uh, but you know, you get older, why not be naive? And, and, and in a, in a, but I think that's, that's the transition. And I think that I, I can only speak for myself. My life is a lot better than it was when I was thinking in terms of the sole isolated scholar defending you know, the, the originality of my uh, interpretations. Yeah, Sophia. Uh, you've shown us some very interesting examples of how undergraduate students can work together. They can grab anything out of an archive, things that have never been seen before by, by some of the, the, the archivists, and translate them and put them out there for the world. They can be real producers and colleagues of knowledge. So then what? What's the next step? How do then people come across these translations and use them? I mean, are, is there going, there going to be a way to upload them into Google Books? Flippant answer is you should take my information retrieval class, uh, and and then that's that's that's, what we, that's exactly what we think about. Uh, uh, but I think the the I'll just, just give you the use case, a simple use case right now. You go you you go the Walters Art Gallery, God bless them, have digitized and made available on a Creative Commons license for anyone to use beautiful images of manuscripts of Latin, Arabic. Uh, and Old French and other languages, uh, and Greek. Uh, and you look at, the at these manuscripts, and I, could, I have a slide of them somewhere. They're beautiful. Then what? So I, let's just assume you've gotten there, uh, and you say, what am I looking at? That's your, what, your, what, my, what my students to do is, ex is allow someone to see more fully, see what they're, look at something, and see it at a depth and a meaning in it that they could not otherwise have acquired. Because to some extent, that's really what the liberal education is about. So that when you acquire liberal education, when you hear music, you hear more than you would have heard without it. When you see something, you see, you see patterns and meaning that you would never otherwise have acquired. That your life, your senses, your intellectual life is, is more rich, more satisfying, more powerful than it ever otherwise could be. And what you're doing is contributing in some small way to someone else being able to do that. Uh, and there are, but in terms of the tactical side of things, that's a whole no, that, that, there are lots of ways to do it. I can't even think of how to start for now, but it can be, it can be done. But, but I, I don't think, my experience is people just want to have the sense that someday someone might run into this and it'd be useful. Uh, the more they do it, the better. But just the idea that it's there, it's permanent, and someone may use it, that's the, that's the tipping point. So I think probably people were getting... Make it long enough. So I hope that everybody could join me in thanking Professor Crane for his lecture.